In this lecture, we're going to cover three main topics, obstructive CAD, non-obstructive CAD, and the concept of typical versus atypical symptoms of ACS. Obstructive CAD is, is the traditional ACS that we're used to. This is the disease of the epicardial arteries known as macrovascular disease. Similarly, we're going to briefly review Prince Metals angina, also known as variant angina, which I've denoted as vasospastic CAD, just, just to keep it uh, consistent with the, the category of obstructive CAD. Next, we're going to talk about non-obstructive CAD, which encompasses um, a relatively newer designation of CAD called coronary microvascular disease. And this is notably uh, different from epicardial disease in that it it is, a, it is a disease of um, endothelial dysfunction within the capillary system in the myocardial wall. Um, we'll go into further detail about this in a little bit. This is also known as cardiac syndrome X. Um, and lastly, we're going to, uh, like I said previously, is uh, uh, kind of review the main differences between typical and atypical symptoms for our future patients. Those patients without known coronary heart disease can have risk equivalents that put them at an equal risk of those with established CHD. So when we think about somebody having a risk equivalent for CHD, really what we're talking about is we're looking at uh, we're looking for evidence of of atherosclerotic disease in other organs. For example, if we see disease in the neck, then we need to worry about the heart. If we see disease in the periphery, meaning the legs, but could also mean um, in the gut, in the renal system, um, as well as other, other organs, we need to worry about the heart. Um, anybody with diabetes mellitus, this is a risk equivalent for CHD. And those with chronic kidney disease, same thing. So as a review from the previous lecture, CHD is an ischemic heart disease. And this can be classified in a number of different ways uh, clinically, um, which is really important. We identify this as acute or chronic. Sometimes we can think of this as stable or unstable. And really, when we think of unstable, what we're thinking of is ACS. And this really just boils down to uh, being a supply demand issue of oxygen and nutrients to um, the tissue that needs it. If there's a poor removal of metabolic waste products, if there's inadequate oxygen delivery, we have a problem and um, this can result in tissue necrosis. And ultimately, we need to think about um, kind of all the different ways in which tissue can be injured and the arteries can be injured as well. So we have ischemia, we have thrombosis or clot, we have vasoconstriction, um, and then we can have uh, tissue necrosis. And in the epicardium, subendocardium, and endocardium, we'll kind of differentiate which layers of tissue um, uh, are injured uh, more so than others in the different versions of acute coronary syndrome. And lastly, the presentation of ischemic heart disease, that's IHD, can really differ per patient and per population. Um, and this is the one that I am currently thinking of, the difference between men and women. Um, but classically, all presentations of acute and subacute ischemic heart disease really is anginal chest pain. So complications that we're already familiar with, but just a quick review of, of CHD, is going to be electrophysiological dysfunction. We're going to see problems in an ECG. We see degradation of heart muscle, and ultimately this will fall into um, uh, chronic heart failure. Um, same here, we see adequate, inadequate pumping and filling, um, as well as occasionally we can see valvular degradation. Um, mainly, I'm thinking of mitral regurge or tricuspid regurge. We can see problems with aneurysms within the cardiac muscle, especially the, uh, the left ventricle. We can see decreased quality of life, and then ultimately, uh, we see mortality associated with this. So let's quickly review the anatomy and vasculature of the heart, of the epicardial arteries, as well as of the muscle uh, layers itself. So first and foremost, um, we see the left main artery, as seen right here. 
And the left main artery uh, branches and um, is made up of the left interior descending as well as the left circumflex artery. Um, the LAD is also known as the Widowmaker, um, which essentially speaks for itself, its importance, it speaks for itself. Next, we have the right coronary artery um, seen here, again, of incredible importance. Um, injury to either one, I'm sorry, to any one of these three can cause anything from sudden cardiac death to, um, to pretty profound um, uh, left and right ventricular dysfunction. And when we focus in specifically on the muscle and the tissue, we're going to identify a couple of different um, uh, layers here. The first and most innermost in the lumen, which is right here, is going to be this endocardium. And this really coats the, this is very much kind of like the interior of a, um, an arterial, um, uh, of an artery. Um, this is kind of the inner lining, if you will, of the, uh, of the heart. And this is really the blood muscle barrier. Um, next, just underneath that, I'll make this a, a purple here, is we have the subendocardium. This is really important when we talk about trying to differentiate one EKG from another, which we'll get to in the next few slides. Moving on up, we have the myocardium. And lastly, which uh, I should say that the myocardium is made up of vast amounts of interlaced um, uh, myocytes and myofibrils. And lastly, we have the epicardium, which uh, encompasses, just like the tunica adventitia, encompasses the, um, the muscle itself. So atherosclerosis and endothelial dysfunction are the main cause of coronary heart disease. And whether this is through um, a ruptured plaque causing in situ thrombosis or downstream um, thromboemboli, uh, or whether this is through kind of progressive uh, luminal stenosis, this causes the majority of morbidity and mortality uh, in regards to CHD. Most of these lesions um, will be angiographically visible. So what we'll do first is we're going to kind of classify and tease out these definitions of unstable angina, and STEMI, and STEMI. And first what we're going to do is we're going to look at unstable angina. Um, and I've kind of made up this X and Y axis. Here we're going to say symptoms, severity of symptoms over time. And before I get into this, what we will say is that unstable angina is defined as angina that occurs at rest or angina that is worsening over time. And that lasts for a duration of less than 10 to 20 minutes. And so these symptoms, when they happen, are going to happen for a distinct period of time and then they're going to stop. And then uh, there will be a period of time that passes and there might be another distinct, um, there might be another distinct um, episode of symptoms that are now uh, more severe and perhaps last for a little bit longer time. And then again, there might be a third episode, and I'm kind of making this up here, but there might be a third episode that um, um, that happens after a period of time. And what we see is we see this kind of escalation of symptoms here with a small reprieve in the middle. Now, the worry about this is that this is going to turn into an end STEMI, and we'll get to defining that again in just a minute, an end STEMI or a STEMI, and these things can all be very life-threatening. Now, histologically, what's happening here is, let me get my colors right, is here we have a, uh, we'll, we'll call this the LAD, and this is the same thing, the LAD over here. 
And what we have is we have um, an atherosclerotic plaque, and we can see a little bit of necrotic core right there. This is a fibroatheroma. And what has happened is this fibroatheroma has become um, thrombogenic. And boom, look what happens. A platelet collects and sticks, but it doesn't stick for too long. And while it is sticking, it's, it is occluding this epicardial artery and causing ischemia. And this is the left ventricle right here. This is the left ventricular myocardium right here. And here's the LAD. So this is transient ischemia, which comes and then it disappears. Now the body either lyses this in situ or uh, this uh, clot is then shot distally um, downstream, gets stuck, and, uh, and the body lyses it there. So again, this is transient ischemia. Transient and progressive. So if this is transient and progressive and doesn't last long enough to actually um, uh, injure and necrose uh, the myocardium, then what we see is we do not see any troponins at all. So this lab here, what we're looking for is we're looking for CKMB and we're for looking for troponins. And if there is no necrosis, uh, if there is no um, real prolonged ischemia, what we're gonna see is probably a normal EKG. Now, when we move to n STEMI, instead of seeing this transient um, kind of transient episodic progressive worsening of pain, what we are gonna see is we are gonna see an onset of pain, which will be constant. Uh, it also may be progressing as well. Progressing to an NSTEMI, I'm sorry, to a STEMI. But this constant progression here denotes um, the fact that this is that uh, an NSTEMI is a partial occlusion. So again, we have this atherosclerotic plaque with this fibrotic, uh, with this necrotic core. And what we have now is we have a clot that is now stuck and is not being laced. So again, this is a partial occlusion, which means that it begins to affect the entire, the entire myocardium with ischemia. So there is now a, um, a supply demand issue. Now, the longer that there's a supply demand issue, um, the more likely that we are going to see necrosis. And again, when we see necrosis, wow, that's uh, impressive there. When we see necrosis, we are likely going to see uh, troponins. Not all the time, but we are likely going to see um, uh, uh, troponins as well as CKMB. Now, the reason we discussed briefly the um, musculature anatomy on the previous slides, talking about the endocardium, the subendocardium, and the myocardium, and the epicardium, is that these layers are actually affected differently with ischemia. And as these layers are being affected differently, they inform what the EKG will likely look like. So the longer there is regular um, uh, ischemia, the first location that this is really begins to um, to kill 
and necrose myocardium is in the subendocardium. And as this spreads, we're going to see more and more layers of the myocardium uh, be affected in kind of uh, this uh, pattern like so. So it spreads from the interior all the way to the exterior. So with that subendocardial ischemia and tissue death, what we begin to see is these types of ECG changes. So we see an ST depression, or we see T wave inversion, or we see both. So this is why we call this a non-ST elevation MI, because when we have an ST elevation MI, what this is talking about is not a partial occlusion, we're talking about a complete occlusion. Another way to put this is an NSTEMI denotes subendocardial ischemia. Whereas in an NSTEMI, we have what's called transmural. ischemia. So starting at the top, again, we have an acute onset and symptoms are available to get worse. But again, these symptoms are variable according to the patient and population. And again, in our small um, arterial lumen with our necrotic core, we have um, an, a sudden acute occlusion of the entire LAD, which as in the previous um, gross specimen, which we had in the end STEMI is going to affect the entire, uh, say, uh, distributive portion um, where the LAD is connected to the myocardium. And as in the end STEMI, Initially, the subendocardium will be affected and necrose, and next, the myocardium will be affected and necrose, and finally, the epicardium will be affected and necrose. So this is what's called a transmural ischemia, or it goes all the way through. Because there is such profound necrosis, we have positive CKMB and troponins. And then we have an ECG, a characteristic ECG in two or more leads that look like this. And here we have this characteristic hump, which is an elevated J point, which is this little point right in between the, uh, the R and the S. And this is your ST elevation. So again, just to reiterate that unstable angina and STEMI and STEMI are all on a continuum and they can all progress quite quickly within the matter of minutes. This, this slide simply shows a summary of how obstructive CHD um, evolves in an ECG. This is just kind of a review of the last uh, of the last slide, but gives, I think, a much more concise um, evolution from one um, ischemic injury to the next as it evolves over time. In this slide here, we can see evidence of what we were just talking about. This appears to be a septal myocardial infarction, which I will show in purple here fairly easy to see. It's pretty much anywhere we see this kind of dark, dusky uh, necrosis. And again, uh, this is a transmural MI. And I'm mainly coming up with that because it looks as though it's, uh, it is the ischemia and this necrosis has penetrated the entire septum, which we can see. Here, just to kind of let you know, this is the left ventricle as it's much more thick over here, and this is the right ventricle.
Another manifestation of coronary heart disease is called non-obstructive coronary heart disease. And this differs in that in non-obstructive coronary heart disease, we're specifically talking about the microvasculature. Microvasculature in this setting is when we're talking about um, uh, the capillary system that spawns from the epicardial arteries. So in macrovascular disorders, we've, we have thrombosis and stenosis of the epicardial arteries. In the microvascular disease, we have more of a dysfunction uh, spawning from uh, spawning from folks that have diabetes. Uh, these tend to be women. These tend to be um, 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 older folks as well with um, a left ventricular hypertrophy. And what this does is this uh, leads to dysfunction and damage of the capillary system. Another name of this is called corn, uh, I'm sorry, cardiac syndrome X. So the typical presentation is going to be a woman age 40 to 50 that comes in with classic anginal chest pain, has evidence of endothelial cell dysfunction, and we've completely excluded variant angina. Typically, there will be a positive nuclear stress test, which shows, which shows evidence of ischemia. However, when we perform coronary angiography, we find that their coronaries are clean, meaning that, that there's no angiographically significant uh, stenosis. Something else I forgot to mention is during the initial workup over here, we tend to see that there is a transient um, ST segment depression or an n STEMI. Let's have a further look at what this looks like histologically. When we're talking about macrovascular circulation, again, we're not talking about these uh, kind of larger arterial uh, disorders of stenosis and thrombosis that travel around, um, uh, around the heart as epicardial arteries do, but instead what we're talking about is the, is the microcirculation, and this is found embedded deeply into the myocardium. So small arteries, arterioles, and capillaries tend to get smushed, um, is kind of a, a layman's way of thinking about it, tend to get smushed and also tend to have um, higher rates of endothelial dysfunction when we have a big, thick myocardium. So folks that have hypertrophied muscle, and here we'll say this is the LV, this is the LAD, and this is all of its Uh, distribution of circulation. So when we have an LV here that has incredibly high luminal pressures, what this typically does is the pressure itself uh, compresses all of the microcirculation within the muscle. When these capillaries and when these arterioles are compressed on top of other risk factors of CAD like hypertension and hyperlipidemia and typically diabetes, there tends to be a higher rate of um, endothelial cell dysfunction, which has the classic um, kind of constellation of issues as decreased nitric oxide production and decreased prostacyclin production. Another thing that we see here is the difference between systole over here and diastole. Is diastole is typically where all of these, um, where all of the circulation is able to fill. This is how the heart literally gets its own circulation is through diastole. If we have diastolic dysfunction and we have a thickened heart, um, it becomes sometimes difficult, sometimes impossible to um, efficiently perfuse all of these downstream capillaries. So what this results in is a lot of chronic inflammation and a lot of fibrosis in this general area over here. Let's put it in in red. So all of this kind of squiggly area over here turns into fibrosis and this is how we can get things like diastolic dysfunction and also lead to pathways of systolic dysfunction as well. So here's a great slide where we can actually see the difference of, say, the large LAD with some of its arterial offshoots. And then what we can see is we can see this capillary distribution.
if if we have a large here's the lv if we have a high amount of transluminal pressure here which is compressing and compressing and compressing um, all of these capillaries it's going to be really hard for oxygen to move through for co2 to to move away and for micronutrients uh, to be able to uh, move in and out of all of the myocardial cells. This results in ECG dis um, abnormalities or electrical dysfunction um, and ultimately can look like an N-STEMI in times of exertion, just like any other type of um, acute coronary syndrome. Another type of, of occlusive heart disease is coronary artery vasospasm, also known as variant angina or Prince Metals angina. And this was previously covered by your lecture. Let's briefly review it. So in variant angina, this is a vasospastic disorder that constricts um, epicardial arteries and induces ischemia. And again, this is episodic. There are clusters of angina and spasm, and typically these are triggered by exertion, by cold weather, emotional stress, cocaine, or smoking. And this is felt to be some sort of an endothelial dysfunction issue with low nitric oxide, hyperreactive smooth muscle constriction. And folks that have variant angina tend to be younger, uh, Japanese, uh, they have fewer uh, traditional cardiac risk factors and have associated history of migraine and Raynaud's phenomenon. On ECG, when there is a constriction, we can see transient ST changes ranging anywhere from an, an N-STEMI to a STEMI. But the moment that this, um, that this spasm ends, then all of this stops. So what we see here is a coronary artery uh, vasospasm of the LAD during an angiogram. And in contrast, you can see what happens after um, isosorbide dinitrate, which is essentially increases the amount of nitric oxide in the endothelium, which as we know, increases the amount of vasodilatation. Uh, is administered here. So what we can see is how severe some of these spasms can be. We have the entire circuit, the entire mac uh, macrovascular cir circulation is occluded and stenosed, and here it is um, it is released. So the purpose of this image was just to demonstrate how significant this can be. Uh, in this um, uh, in this image. Uh, one might appear to the emergency room either with an end STEMI, depending on how bad the ischemia is, or with uh, a full transmural STEMI. Another common presentation of cardiac angina is for folks that have chronic hypertension, accelerated hypertension, or hypertensive emergencies. And in this image, what we can see here is we see the RV and we see the LV, and we can see how small uh, this lumen is. What this lumen is telling me is that um, is there is chronic increased um, luminal pressures from chronic, probably untreated hypertension. And what this can result in is really poor blood flow in this area in here. And again, this has to do with the microcirculation um, as previously discussed. So again, if we have uh, really high luminal pressures and we also have um, macrovascular endothelial dysfunction, if we already have say poor or inadequate or inefficient blood flow because of, say, atherosclerosis, what happens is uh, this kind of interior area here, and again, even more so in the subendocardium, is we're going to see progressive ischemia and chronic subacute ischemia. Now, what happens is the green X's and the yellow X's um, will demonstrate an increased amount of fibrosis, 
um, a reduction in regular perfusion and what this can do besides leading to different types of uh, heart failure. Again, this is most consistent with something that we would see in diastolic heart failure, but can also contribute to a path towards systolic heart failure is this can lead to arrhythmia and then can also lead to congestive heart failure. So again, just to reiterate is that chronic hypertension can lead to an anginal type of syndrome in times of exertion as if it were uh, any other type of acute coronary syndrome. So if we were to do a stress test, a nuclear stress test, and look to see how the perfusion is in, inside the, uh, the myocardial wall, we very well might see evidence of um, decreased perfusion, say, on one portion. On one portion of the wall, or perhaps on several different portions of the wall. And what this has to do with, again, is that microcirculation disorder. If we were to then follow up that stress test with a coronary angiogram, what we might see is that the, the coronaries are actually normal. So this disorder has to do with massive or progressive um, hypertrophy of the left ventricle, increased transmural pressure, poor coronary flow during diastole, again that filling, and dysfunctional microvasculature which leads to poor oxygenation. All of this is worse with occlusive disease. Our last topic is gonna to be talking about acute coronary syndrome symptoms. So if we wanna get right down to it, we have two main kinds of anginal symptoms that we need to classify and we need to be aware of clinically. We are going to look for discomfort and this discomfort can show up in many different locations, but most commonly for men and for women is gonna be this retrosternal, retrosternal chest discomfort. So again, we can kind of see it in this elderly gentleman right here. You can see that the majority of uh, this gentleman's uh, symptoms are going to be uh, along the precordial wall and then extending down his arm. This follows nerve fibers and then also in the neck as well. These symptoms can also show up in the mid-back. These symptoms tend to get worse with eating, exertion, cold exposure, and stress. And then lastly, they get better with relief or rest. And these are types of questions that you're gonna ask the patient. Classically, there's gonna be, um, for anginal chest pain, there's really gonna be no change with respiration, cough, or position, and there will be a positive Levine sign. Please look up and see what that looks like. However, when we move to atypical angina, this is what the other half of the population is going to feel. And when we talk about atypical angina, we also want to talk about anginal equivalence. So let's see if we can define this. So anginal equivalents are symptoms of myocardial ischemia other than angina pectoris, or that's that substernal chest pain but they hold the same importance of typical symptoms. Folks tend to be older, they tend to be female, and they tend to be diabetic, or they tend to be all of the above. So anginal equivalent type of presentations can be dyspnea alone. So if somebody shows up with, um, again, if they show up, if you're concerned about UA, if, if they show up instead of chest pain, say progressive, chest pain, they might have progressive symptoms of nausea, vomiting, and dyspnea instead, and absolutely no chest pain. Um, weakness is another one. Palpitations, dizziness, and syncope can, can also be anginal equivalents. So if anybody presents with these types of symptoms, you always have to think, is there some sort of silent or atypical presentation of acute coronary syndrome going on? The problem with atypical angina is that they usually go under the radar, not so much anymore, but it's, it's possible to be distracted by um, the thought that somebody has nausea and vomiting and think that they might have a GERD or some sort of a gastrointestinal illness. What happens is this tends to 
um, lead to misdiagnosis and increased hospital mortality. Gender bias is a big part of medicine. It's a big part of any type of workplace, but especially in terms of diagnosis of women uh, versus men. So women with coronary heart disease tend to be, again, in that we can call it atypical or we can call it different. Um, they tend to be in a different category um, than men in terms of presentation uh, and in terms of age of presentation. So women with CHD are typically 10 to 15 years older than men at the time of their first MI and they have a higher risk burden. Now what that means is given that they've led a longer life, uh, they tend to have higher incidences of obesity, hypertension, uh, untreated diabetes or progressive diabetes or have lived longer with diabetes uh, or other types of risk factors. Another thing is that um, the research bears out that women don't initially identify these symptoms. And again, sometimes these symptoms can be atypical, um, which can fly under the radar of a layperson. So women don't initially identify their symptoms, whether, whether they're typical or atypical symptoms of, as CHD, and practitioners are less likely to evaluate for CHD. If we look at uh, some of the main differences between men and women um, in terms of ACS presentation or cardiac angina, we see that women tend to have an increased um, uh, trigger of ACS during sleep, at rest, during emotional stress, uh, and during exertion. And this is a big one right here. Um, in my own um, kind of dealings in medicine, the anxious female, sometimes you can consider this uh, an anginal equivalent. If somebody has chest pain but has a history of anxiety, it can mask um, it can mask what's really going on. Women tend to have a higher prevalence of silent Q wave MI, and a Q wave MI is another uh, version of saying transmural MI. That said, sudden cardiac death tends to be lower than men, and when we're considering women uh, in an ACS workup, what tends to be more important when we're looking at uh, coronary heart disease in women is to actually ask about hormonal status, diabetes, smoking, and family history of premature heart disease. Gender bias is something that is real and it happens every day. Uh, what this is is that healthcare providers, whether they are male or female, tend to be colored by a patient's affect. By affect, I mean uh, if there are any psych issues going on, if there's any trust issues going on, um, healthcare providers tend to underdiagnose or to blow off, or, or I should not blow off, but I would say uh, not consider a full range of differential diagnoses when you're considering typical and atypical symptoms of acute coronary syndrome. There have been several studies that document gender-based differences in utilization rates of coronary angiography and revascularization among those with an acute MI. So what this means is that women that come in with evidence of um, acute coronary syndrome, re research has borne out that um, that healthcare practitioners tend to um, uh, use uh, validated protocol less. So a, this female patient might not get coronary angiography or standard revascularization techniques that would normally be offered and given to men. And what this is, is this reflects physicians' failure to refer women with positive excess tests for subsequent testing to confirm and to treat appropriately ACS. This ultimately leads to poorer outcomes. So please be aware of your own blind spots.